All right, welcome, welcome, everybody. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm really happy to be here, uh, and we're going to talk about something more important than the Eastern Theater, and that is, of course, the Western Theater. And we've got a couple of guys with us to really, uh, you know, hit some of this hard. We're going to end up focusing on uh, sort of November in Tennessee, a little 1863, a little 1864, and a whole lot to put that into context. Uh, we're joined here, uh, if your screen looks like mine, on the upper left by Dave Powell. Dave Powell's a prolific writer and historian and expert on a number of things, but namely Chickamauga. But, and he's a good friend of the trust, by the way, helping us with our animated map uh, and many other products. Uh, Dave, thanks for being here. Thank you. And most of you also probably know Eric Jacobson, uh, CEO of the Battle of Franklin Trust. We have no better partner uh, in preservation and in, unfortunately, in the case of Franklin, uh, reclamation um, than the Battle of Franklin Trust uh, and Eric Jacobson. So Eric, glad, glad to have you here. Glad to be here, thanks. Good, good. So I mean, before we even get into any of the actions, why, why in the world would somebody care about mid 19th century military Tennessee. Well, it's a long state and all, but either one of you guys, why, why is Tennessee important? Dave, I'll let you take the lead. Well, um, if you're gonna get into the South, if you're gonna restore the Union, you're gonna have to go through Tennessee. You noted, you noted it's a long state. It spans uh, the length of the deep South from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River. Uh, so it's pretty unavoidable. And it has some key industries. It has, uh, you know, from a military focus, Tennessee is, is critical. It's, uh, uh, it's the largest or, or second largest producer of mules and horses, uh, immense crops. Uh, uh, Nashville and Memphis provide some very, uh, very much needed industrial capacity. The South doesn't have a lot of industrial capacity. So, uh, Every time you look at Tennessee, you're looking at uh, uh, essentially the, the barricade, the, the front line of the Civil War in the West. Uh, Kentucky is, is trying to be neutral, trying to, be, to have it both ways, uh, but Tennessee is unequivocal. They leave the Union, they uh, initially form their own army and then join the South. Cool. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Tennessee really is is the gateway to the Deep South. I would argue it's as important as Virginia because it's really the buffer between um, the states that remain loyal and those that seceded. And, and so Tennessee's got the Mississippi River on its west end. It's got the Appalachians on the east side. So Middle Tennessee is really a, a vast funnel, um, which which leads to Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Um I've even argued for years that a single rail line that comes through Tennessee, um, which eventually runs all the way to Louisville, but goes down into North Alabama is one of the most important um, rail lines. Plus you've got Tennessee and the Cumberland Rivers, they connect to the Ohio, which connects to the Mississippi. So yeah, it, it's, it's, everything, um, it's everything all in one. Indeed. So, and you've got, you know, it is not a homogenous state. You know, you've got East Tennessee, you know, with a sort of a different, more unionist population uh, than you could say uh, Middle and West Tennessee. Um, I, I like what you said, Eric, too, about the sort of avenues of advance um, on the rivers. It's a whole different ball game in the East, uh, you know, as some Western generals who came East or the reverse uh, quickly found out. Now, you know, you also mentioned, you know, Kentucky's neutrality, and this is a by way of uh, transition. Uh, so early on in 1861, the Confederates are really sorting, sort of trying to make Kentucky the buffer, or even occupy Kentucky. Uh, and Albert Sidney Johnston quickly found out uh, that that whole thing isn't going to happen. So as it starts to unravel, pick your place at Mill Springs, uh, Kentucky, or otherwise, eventually, of course, you know, a lot of Tennessee is going to fall to the Union pretty quickly. Uh, Erica, you know, would, would you be able to sort of go from, you know, February of 1862 to the end of the year in some fashion from Fort Donelson on to Stones River as to what's going on in Tennessee? Well, I, I was I was actually going to start maybe with just the first part of it, and maybe maybe Dave could do this even the second half of the year. But you know, if you look at, at what a what an awful task Albert Sidney Johnston had when he was placed in, in command of this vast department. I mean, he has to protect this massive swath of land and once Kentucky's neutrality is really taken off the table, um, and you see Mill Springs, uh, which is a Confederate defeat, the whole Kentucky line completely implodes. And then Grant starts using rivers, 
really is almost an interstate system. He's driving down the rivers deep into Tennessee and Nashville then just falls without a shot. And it's amazing that within really about three months, Tennessee is largely under federal control, except West Tennessee. And even that falls by the summer of, by the summer of 62. And, and that's why Shiloh becomes very important because Albert City Johnson retreats all the way from Bowling Green through Nashville, loses the capital of Tennessee and ends up in Northeast Mississippi. So he makes this, uh, this gamble to try and knock Grant back, um, which of course he's somewhat successful in the first day, but loses his life in the, in, in the process. And that's one of those moments where, you know, if you look at what happens at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson and, and, and at Shiloh, you could see the dominoes starting to fall against the Confederacy very, very early on. And, and I think Johnston was, was right. He had to take that chance. Um, and then, of course, there's the action that, that, that plays out through the, through the summer of 62. And then, of course, the end of 62 is Murfreesboro. But um, I'm sure Dave could um, add a, a, a bunch more about what's going on. Go ahead, Dave. Well, I think uh, uh, I agree with Eric that, that um, Johnson makes a, a gamble at Shiloh, and I think he makes the right gamble. He simply doesn't have the troops uh, to really defend this this enormous line that he's been given. Uh, yeah, it's it's easily the most thankless job in the Confederacy. Then uh, he loses his life at Shiloh, and suddenly it's uh, Beauregard's job, General uh, Pierre Gustave Toutain Beauregard. We love that name. Uh, he, uh, uh, but he's fairly quickly replaced because of disagreements with, with Jefferson Davis. And so we, it falls to a third man, Braxton Bragg, who, uh, who has to figure out what to do after Shiloh. And he's, he's, he's given uh, one big advantage because the Federals are kind of, uh, after they take Corinth, they're also confused about what to do. They've taken a big chunk of Tennessee. They don't quite know uh, what to do, uh, you know, to secure Tennessee. So they start dispersing their troops. Uh, they, they send various expeditions that, you know, Grant wants to go south along the river. Uh, uh, General Buell, who commands the Army of the Ohio, eventually to become the Army of the Cumberland, uh, starts to push uh, east along the uh, uh, along the Mobile and Ohio, across uh, northern Alabama and Mississippi, to to go threaten Chattanooga, which is another key point. We'll talk about Chattanooga, I suppose, in a little while. But the Federals are doing the same thing to a certain extent. They're splitting their effort all of a sudden. They they're finding out that that even though they have a hundred, hundred and ten thousand men during the siege of Corinth, that's still not enough men to secure all of the countryside. They just have occupied and also continue with their offensive efforts. And that gives Bragg an opportunity. And we can knock Bragg for a lot of things. He's, uh, he's, by, he's far from the world's greatest general, but he has a strong strategic sense. Uh, and he, he really carries out one of the most remarkable strategic movements of the entire war uh, in the early fall, the, the summer and early fall of 1862. He takes that army that Johnson assembled at Corinth, that Beauregard retreated down to Tupelo with. He takes that army, he moves them to Chattanooga, and then he uh, marches north, uh, bypasses Nashville. And uh, the next thing you know, it's August and September, and we're in Perryville, Kentucky. We're in the heart of the bluegrass again. Uh, we're further north, if you're a Confederate, you're further north than, uh, than Albert Sidney Johnson ever got. And that ends, of course, at the Battle of Perryville with, uh, with a Confederate defeat. And I say defeat sort of, because it's really an impressive tactical performance, but strategically there's no hope of, of Confederate success or continued uh, chance to hold Kentucky. So they fall back into Tennessee and that's where the thing normalizes. If you had, if you had guessed the, this outcome, say, uh, right after Shiloh in April of 1862, you said, well, we'll be, you know, the Confederates will be in Middle Tennessee around Murfreesboro and the North will be in Nashville. People would be, the, the Northern side anyway, would, would be laughing at you. They'd, they'd, 
they were so confident that they were going to conquer the South and, and really possibly even end the war by the summer of 62. That's great. And let me compliment uh, Chris White for the telestration that we're able to get here. Uh, Chris, our senior education manager, thank you very much for doing this. And you know, Dave, you said some, you both guys both said some really interesting things, you know, um, you know, first of all, this idea that the Union is a victim of its success. I mean, what is it, 100,000 square miles of territory that the Union is sort of going to get in the Trans-Mississippi and in the West? You know, just in 1862 alone, uh, that is a lot of land uh, to deal with. So maybe an impossible task uh, for the sort of invader, victor, whatever you want to call them at the time. Um, and secondly, I mean, this 1862 movement, you've got Bragg moving up into Kentucky, you've got, uh, uh, you know, uh, Robert E. Lee moving up into Maryland and whatnot. It looks, some people love to call this the Confederate high tide instead of uh, other actions going on elsewhere, like in Pennsylvania. Um, and I think that the Bragg McClellan sort of dynamic also brings up something. I mean, generals that we like to make fun of or that do some things that we think they could have done better also do good things. McClellan and Bragg both do a lot of things very well. And we don't seem to like to accept that, you know, in people of the past. We want them to be all great or all terrible, right? Yeah, you know, Dave made a great point because Bragg is really a very, very good strategist. He never gets the credit that he deserves. Bragg's issue, in my opinion, is his tactical um, limitations or flaws would show up when the, when the battle actually began. And I also think Bragg tended to um, be a bit pensive when, when the combat actually began. But yeah, his invasion of Kentucky is a crazy, um, crazy effective march. It's just culmination of it at Perryville is certainly not what he anticipated. I, I'd like to add one other thing when it comes to, especially the first half of 62, why Shiloh, I think is so key. If you consider that had Johnston been successful, not just in reclaiming Tennessee, Albert Sidney Johnson, and, and even Beauregard the next day, although I don't think Beauregard deserves kind of all the flack he gets, you know, he didn't lose Shiloh. That battle was being lost by the midpoint on the first day. But imagine had the Confederate effort been successful. They could have essentially knocked the two most successful US generals of the entire war off the table. Grant and Sherman likely don't command anything of size if they fail at Shiloh. So Shiloh has so many layers of failure for the Confederacy. And then when you look at everything going on in the East, especially from the summer of 62 forward, it's just the Robert E. Lee show and nothing's really going well for the Confederacy out West for the entire year. Bragg tries to spark some hope, but that, that disappears in the, in the, Kentucky heartland, where Bragg found out, as the old saying goes, Kentucky wasn't nearly as Southern um, as it is today until after the Civil War, because he found out that there wasn't a lot of Confederate support in that part of Kentucky. That's great. Uh, thanks, Eric. So you're with the American Battlefield Trust. Uh, we're with Eric Jacobson of the Battle of uh, Franklin Trust and prolific and expert historian Dave Powell, uh, who writes on all things or many things, uh, Tennessee and Georgia, and of course, otherwise as well. Uh, a lot of the resources that uh, Chris White is pulling up for you to see right now are of course from the uh, American Battlefield Trust uh, website, battlefields.org. Um, you'll certainly find a lot there if you're not already reading our articles and uh, watching our videos and things like that, which our guests have, have often helped us with as well. So I always find it helpful to try to break down these big movements. I mean, I know there's a lot of battles in between things, right? You know, a lot of people like in the East to go from, well, Gettysburg, then the Overland Campaign, when there was, you know, something like 16 battles in between there. But um, the, the war in the West also does con consist of a of a limited number of grand movements. Uh, when Eric was talking about, and, and Dave, about the invasion of Kentucky or Bragg's movement into Kentucky, I mean, you're talking Munfordville and Richmond and all sorts of other things, but it really culminates at Perryville. So when you look at it, the Union sort of took Fort Donelson, Nashville Falls, that in an indirect way results in the Union victory at Shiloh and for the Union to then occupy uh, Corinth, Mississippi. That in itself will lead to a Confederate attempted uh, takeover of Corinth, Mississippi back, uh, later in October of 1862. And at that same time is when Bragg is moving north and eventually moves back down south toward Nashville and Murfreesboro, where I'll ask Dave to pick up again. Dave, if you could take us, you know, so you've got Bragg in Middle Tennessee. Um, 
and you have union forces not all that far away. Uh, will you take us from there and until what happens into the fall of 1863, if possible? Well, to take one quick step back, uh, one thing we need to acknowledge about the West is uh, we've talked about the scope of it. We also need to talk about the difficulty of the logistics uh, for conducting movements. Uh, you know, you've heard a, uh, a thousand times the distance between Richmond and Washington is 100 miles. Um, uh, the movement from Mississippi to Kentucky is hundreds of miles. And even the move from Nashville to Chattanooga, which is going to be the focus of the next Union efforts really through from the end of 1862 up to the fall of 1863, is, is a good 100, 150 miles. And it's through, uh, once you uh, get into Southeast Tennessee, uh, it's through some of the most intimidating country in the world, or in the country, I should say. Uh, the, uh, the southern end of the Appalachian chain runs all the way down into Alabama. So if you're going to get to, uh, if you're going to get to Georgia and the Carolinas uh, and, and do it without taking a huge end run, you're going to have to go through the city of Chattanooga which is where the Tennessee River has carved a, a water level passage through the southern end of the Appalachian. And uh, all of these next campaigns, the, the Murfreesboro campaign, uh, which is just a week long, we, we, uh, General Rosecrans has replaced General Buell in, at the end of October, 1862. His first job is to attack the Confederates uh, in, in Middle Tennessee uh, which culminates in the Battle of Murfreesboro, uh, December 1 to January 2nd, or December 31 to January 2nd. And that battle ends in a draw, and then both sides take, uh, at least in the central theater, take a breather uh, for six months, as a matter of fact. The reason for that is those logistics, is that geography. The rivers don't support these movements. Uh, uh, the uh, in the Eastern theater, the, uh, the Union Army always has the advantage of the Atlantic seaboard. If they, uh, if they move closer to the seaboard, they can establish logistical bases further and further south. Grant, of course, has the rivers, the Tennessee, uh, the Cumberland, and most especially in 1863, the Mississippi. But the rivers stop being those super highways into the deep south once you get in uh, to East Tennessee. Once the Tennessee River takes its big bend in Alabama and flows eastward, the water's too shallow, the, the things are impassable. So most of what the Union Army is doing in Tennessee in 1863, certainly the first six months of it, are laying the groundwork for a major logistical movement. Uh, and and it, the groundwork is laid so successfully that ultimately when you come back and talk about Atlanta, we'll still be talking about those union preparations in Middle Tennessee in 1863, because that's the building blocks of, of even the 1864 campaigns. Um, and, and after Murfreesboro, uh, Rosecrans launches what we call now the Tullahoma campaign in, in uh, late June. It's the same thing, it's a movement uh, another leap forward from Murfreesboro essentially to the Tennessee River line where uh, the, the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad crosses the Tennessee River at Bridgeport. Uh, and it's another dazzling campaign of movement. Uh, Braxton Bragg is not the only man who can launch ambitious logistical efforts. Uh, Rosecrans has prepared himself pretty well. Uh, and then uh, Tullahoma succeeds. And within six months, or I mean six weeks, we're talking about yet another forward movement, and that's the Chickamauga campaign that takes us to uh, uh, actually captures Chattanooga. Chattanooga falls to the Union Army on September 9th, much like Nashville fell uh, in February 62. That fell without a shot fired because the Union armies had maneuvered and outflanked the Confederates. Braxton Bragg is still in command. He's um, He's, he's overwhelmed by the, the Union movement, and so he abandons Chattanooga. And then they fight the, the second largest battle of the war, Chickamauga, by, uh, depending on how you count it. Um, in September 1819 and 20, 1863, uh, Bragg has is, is been heavily reinforced. He counterattacks against Rosecrans. 
and uh, beats the Union Army, beats Rosecrans pretty badly, but they don't lose Chattanooga. The Federals retreat into the city of, Tra of Chattanooga and keep control of it. And that's vital because, like I said, that's the gateway to the Deep South. And as long as they hold Chattanooga, they have a strategic advantage. Good. Um, and, and let me just, because it's tempting for us to right now talk about Chattanooga, but we want to skip over this and come back to it. Let's lay out some more campaign stuff um, by doing it, uh, uh, by, by way of actually getting there. So uh, this is September, October, and through November of 1863. Uh, you're going to have a command change around Chattanooga during that time, and it's not going to go well for the South. Sorry to spoil the end there. And then uh, that will allow us to fast forward in a way um, through the winter into the spring. You know what happens. Uh, Grant moves east. Sherman takes over uh, the Union Army uh, at Chattanooga, moves on Atlanta. Atlanta falls uh, September 2nd. And then an interesting thing happens. And I think Eric can pick up here a little bit. You know, eventually at some point, uh, Sherman's going to take Atlanta and march to the sea. Uh, that's not what his then opponent or defeated opponent or outmaneuvered opponent John Bell Hood does, right, Eric? That's right. Do, do, can I take a minute or two, um, Gary, to, to backtrack to 63? Sure. Do we have time? Sure. So D Dave po pointed out in, in great detail how the movement really goes from Murfreesboro and to Chattanooga and then to Chickamauga and kind of bounces back to Chattanooga. I think it's important to note that on a parallel track, that summer of 63, there's something playing out um, in Middle Tennessee, especially Southern Middle Tennessee, and then of course in Mississippi that we can't forget. William Tecumseh Sherman and U.S. Grant begin um, employing their first real uh, push toward total war. They actually take the rail line that runs from Nashville all the way to Decatur, Alabama, and then from Decatur to Chattanooga, and then that line from Chattanooga that runs back up to uh, the north of west through Murfreesboro to Nashville, they turn that entire rail system into a big one-way supply system. So they're sending materials so, south, down the tracks to Decatur. They can ship it east to Chattanooga and run the empty cars back up to Nashville. They run this thing on a big triangle. But at the same time, we have the Vicksburg campaign. So Chattanooga, of course, Grant eventually shows up in Chattanooga, but only after he's unleashed Grenville Dodge, the railroad guy, in repairing the, the network, these guys know they're going to need to continue to prosecute the war. Sherman's already living off the land in, in uh, southern middle Tennessee. And then Grant takes Vicksburg, which, of course, opens up the Mississippi and gets him, uh, the guy who the Confederate forces just can never seem to quite finish off. Where does he go? He goes to Chattanooga and he and, and he brings, you know, success there with with. Uh, with the fighting in November of 63. So I just think it's important to point out that there's really two big things going on in 63 in the West. And it's almost like there's two theaters within one. Um, Vicksburg kind of gets lost in the shuffle of everything that's happening sometimes in Tennessee and, and, and into Georgia. But yeah, then in 64, um, you know, we've got the big push from, from Chattanooga um, down to Atlanta. And of course, I mean, you can just, you just, just follow the dots, Nashville, Murfreesboro, Chattanooga, Atlanta. That's just driving the stake deeper and deeper, not just into the geographic South, but deeper into really the heart of the Confederacy. And, um, you know, Nashville helps get Lincoln reelected as well. So you can't, you can't really underestimate um, its importance. Good. Well, why don't you uh, keep rocking um, and take us so Sherman marches to the sea. Where does Hood go? Well, you know, so Hood gets command a few months before Atlanta falls. He, he replaced Johnston, uh, not Albert Sidney, of course, but Joseph Johnston. And, and Hood, you know, he has a really kind of thankless task, task too. I mean, how are you going to stop Sherman? You're outnumbered and all Sherman eventually has to do is just cut the supply lines, the railroads into the city, and then, and then the city is essentially use, useless. So Hood loses it, and Davis, Jefferson Davis visits the army, uh, the Confederate army, at the end of September 64, and that's really the genesis of what becomes known as the Tennessee campaign. There's no doubt there was discussion about trying to draw Hood out, 
or, uh, there was discussion about trying to draw Sherman out of Atlanta and, and defeat him in detail. But it's also very clear that they talked about Middle Tennessee and they talked about Nashville and that that might end up being the goal because for the Confederates at this point, it's not an issue of trying to win the war. You're trying not to lose the war. And so Hood has some initial success at places like Rosaka and Big Shanty. And, you know, he tears up a bunch of railroads and captures a few garrisons. But by the time he moves into East Alabama, Northeast Alabama, Sherman's just tired of the chase. He's already pitching to Grant and Lincoln this idea that he wants to move east. Sherman had, had practiced total war in Mississippi, especially East Mississippi in 63. Now he was ready to unleash it in the fall of 64. And it takes some convincing. You know, Grant and Lincoln, they want him to deal with Hood and Sherman believes he can dispatch troops to Middle Tennessee, which he does. He puts them under the command of George Henry Thomas, you know, who's, I think, behind Sherman and Grant, probably the best, and um, sends about 30,000 troops back there. And then he takes the rest of his army and moves east from Atlanta. And so Hood, Hood really is trying to keep hope alive. Hood's got about 30,000 men. And I think it's important also to note that the Army of Tennessee that existed after Atlanta was certainly much smaller than it had once been, but this was an army that had been at all of the places we've already discussed, Shiloh, Murfreesboro, Perryville, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, they fought all around Atlanta. You know, the dead are dead, wounded have gone home, some guys have mustered out. So what you have left is really a hardened veteran army, but also some of the real, some of the real true believers. And, um, you know, they, they give it quite a run and they come, they come so close at Spring Hill. And I would argue they fight as furiously and with as much dedication as they ever had at Franklin. And, and so does the other side. I mean, the U.S. troops of the 4th and the 23rd Corps, they knew that two and a half years of work um, was, was on the ropes, that if Hood somehow could just really seriously threaten Nashville, this just this just looked terrible. In fact, one one of the old veterans said, well, Sherman and his pets got all the glory in Georgia. We had to do the heavy lifting back in Middle Tennessee. So, yeah, it's um, Franklin to me, although there's the Battle of Nashville, Franklin, Franklin's really it in Western theater. I mean, Nashville's a foregone conclusion after what happens. Franklin. Okay, good. Thanks, guys. So we, we do want to focus in on um, Chattanooga and Franklin a little bit as we go. But first of all, let, let's tie this up, though. I mean, is there... I mean, the West as we knew it, we've been talking a lot about what's going on in primarily Tennessee, but also a little bit of Kentucky and Northern Alabama and uh, Mississippi and, and even into Georgia. But I mean, the, the West as we know it, I mean, after Franklin, after Nashville, it's, there's nothing going on. The West is now in the Carolinas and Georgia, right? Yeah. Well, Sherman certainly makes that turn. He gets to the sea at Savannah and then he turns north. Um, and I, and I think he hasn't eliminated the Southern capacity for industrial power in, in, the, in Georgia and Alabama that, uh, that he started out. Uh, you know, he, he bypasses some places, uh, the Augusta Powder Works, for instance, but he's made it extremely difficult for the Confederacy to, to use those resources and concentrate them effectively. Um, and so he's, he's largely gutted a big chunk of the South, uh, and and there is almost um, no major war to fight. Say in 1865, uh, there are certainly forces in the field. There are uh, uh, we have a camp in late 64. We had a campaign against Mobile, and then uh, uh, there's a cavalry raid. Wilson uh, James Harrison Wilson Wilson runs a cavalry raid across. Uh, uh, Georgia and Alabama, but the major campaigns have largely ended by the beginning of 1865, and, and the Confederacy is shrinking dramatically as we talk about it. Uh, Good. Right. Um, okay, well then I'm going to stick with Dave here. We're going to move up to Chattanooga again. Remember, uh, so Braxton Bragg uh, wins a huge victory, uh, or at least it's a victory at Chat at Chickamauga. Uh, Rosecrans retreats first with a portion, then with his entire 
uh, force back to Chattanooga. It's November of 1863. And just to get Dave a little bit worked up here, because I think that most of what, a lot of what people know about Chattanooga, you know, is just wrong. So let me play that card a little bit and say that I guess at Chattanooga, um, Hooker's a genius, uh, Rosecrans has no plan, uh, and uh, Grant comes along and saves the day. Okay, go ahead, Dave, take us up to, it's primarily Lookout Mountain, but what's really going on here? Well, I think we need to, to mention how much of a sense of crisis there is in the North after Rosecrans is defeated and the, the surviving elements of the Army of the Cumberland, roughly 35 to 40,000 men retreat into Chattanooga and they're besieged. They're virtually surrounded. They have, uh, they're, they're reduced to one very difficult supply route. Now, we're talking the mountains again. The rail and the river line are both uh, unavailable because of Confederate presence. So uh, there's some real talk. There's some real worry in Washington and, and uh, across the North that Rosecrans will have to either abandon Chattanooga or possibly even, God forbid, surrender. His army might be trapped. And I think it's interesting, we were talking about Grant, what happens with Grant, you know, uh, after Vicksburg, kind of the same thing happened with Grant that happened after Shiloh. There was this pause in operations in Mississippi. And the federal government started to talk about what to do with that army. Uh, you know, the 90,000 men roughly that, that were ultimately assembled for the Vicksburg campaign. Um, and they start talking about parceling out, let's send 10,000 to, to General Banks in New Orleans, let's send 10,000 to Arkansas. And, and so between July, well, through July, August, early September, there really is no mission for Grant or for Sherman or the, the arguably the most successful Union Army in the field at the time. And that's a, a kind of an interesting thing to think about. And then along comes Chattanooga and this sense of crisis and almost immediately, uh, we're going to send Grant to Chattanooga. Suddenly, there's a mission again. Uh, Edward Stanton in Virginia or, or in Washington is, is saying, well, let's send 20,000 troops from the Army of the Potomac. That's how we get General Joe Hooker uh, out to, to Chattanooga. And so suddenly, there's a convergence of forces from uh, all theaters of war uh, into southeast Tennessee. And that sets the stage for the, the Chattanooga campaign or the, uh, the relief of Chattanooga, whatever we want to call it. Um, there's my friend Joe Hooker, fighting Joe Hooker. Um, I actually, uh, uh, I, I almost agree with you there, Gary. Uh, uh, maybe not genius, maybe that's a little too strong a word, but still uh, arguably highly successful in the Battle of Chattanooga. Uh, Hooker goes a long way to redeem his, his past transgressions uh, by his performance in the West and especially uh, at Chattanooga. All right, for just for people that who are watching who really don't know what's, you know, who might not know the details of this, there, there is a series of actions going on um, in Chattanooga. Uh, so, you know, Rosecrans is formulating a plan um, to try to feed his army. I mean, this is a very difficult situation. Ultimately, a cracker line will be established to help to feed the army. As Dave mentioned, a whole lot of reinforcements come um, to swell what was Rosecrans's force um, now under Grant, and there will be a series of actions. Um, you know, one of which here helped to secure the cracker line, and where you, the members of the American Battlefield Trust, have been able to help us secure not only the Browns Ferry landing site that helped establish that line, but also uh, more recently, uh, Browns Tavern. Um, you know, not, not too far from it. So uh, uh, we're really psyched about that. And I believe Hooker made his headquarters there at, Brown, at Brown's Tavern. That is going to set up an action called Wahatchee, uh, which will also eventually help to lead to the sort of three days where the Union captures a key hill in Chattanooga called Orchard Knob and then assails both uh, Missionary Ridge and Lookout Mountain or attempts to at least on the 24th and 25th of November 1863. So before I turn it back over to Dave, because I know you'll have some stuff to say about the mountain, that's what we want to talk about. Anyone who's ever seen Lookout Mountain, it's inconceivable that somebody could capture it from mm -hmm. a relatively strong enemy force. But before we turn it over to Dave, Eric, anything on all this stuff we've just been talking about? Well, I was just going to ask, actually, I was going to ask Dave a question. Do you think that it's only in that, uh, you know, couple months after Vicksburg as the crisis around Chattanooga begins to develop 
do you think that's when Lincoln finally realized that Grant might be the guy, you know, he, here, here he was the victor at Shil- Donaldson, Shiloh, Vicksburg, and he just wasn't being utilized. And I think he said Rosecrans was acting like a duck that had been hit on the head. Yes. Um, <laughs> did he, did he not re- is that when, he, when Lincoln said, let, let's get Grant, let's see what he can do. That's exactly when Lincoln said, um, he, uh, uh, well, Grant's army was the obvious choice to send reinforcements, but shortly after um, uh, Chickamauga, after the news broke across the nation of Chickamauga, uh, Lincoln rather emphatically said, let's not just send troops, I'm going to send General Grant. Um, and, and, and frankly, I think Chattanooga is, is really the defining moment of Grant's career, because there's no strategic pause after Chattanooga. There's the winter, of course, which slows things down. But after Chattanooga, no one has any doubts that Grant is coming east. He's going to get uh, that promotion in March 1864 that, that's going to make him the general in chief. Uh, the order, uh, but to, to step back, that order in October 1863, which sends him to Chattanooga, also creates the military division of Mississippi, which gives Grant unified authority over the Department of the Ohio, the Department of the Cumberland, and the Department of Mississippi. So it gives Grant sweeping authority from uh, for Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, all of the Union troops in that entire theater, which the Union had not done. Uh, basically, they did it early in the war with Henry Halleck, then Halleck went east, and there was no longer a unified command in the West uh, for another year until Grant steps forward. Right. Okay. And let me just jump in real quick. Uh, everybody, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. Uh, Chris White behind the scenes here is showing some of the maps that we have. And he also showed you a sneak peek of the cover of our latest book, uh, Maps of the Civil War, Battle Maps of the Civil War. We're now doing the Western Theater. And I think. Uh, you know, you, if you haven't already, you might be getting something in the mail uh, show, uh, offering you how to, you might secure that book. So I don't know, Chris, if you want to throw that uh, graphic back up there. Uh, Chris uh, worked with our uh, map maker, Steve Stanley and others. And this is the second uh, volume of this book. You're looking at, of course, the front and the back cover. And of course, you're seeing the view from Lookout Mountain, uh, which is one of the things Chris was, I think, trying to show there. So check your mail or email for how to get your hands on a copy of this book and save some battlefield land at the same time. Now, so we're not gonna have time to go into the whole battle of um, Chattanooga, but uh, I think you all know the basics of this. The Union is going to be able to move forward toward Lookout Mountain by gaining access to the right roads and and creek crossings um, near Lookout Mountain. Um, In the meantime, the Union has a plan to try to move toward Missionary Ridge um, itself. And that's going to, of course, once they attack the right hill or the right ridge uh, is going to move toward uh, uh, Missionary Ridge on uh, especially the 25th of November. But even the, before that, you've got, if I've got my calculations right, you've got the Union making an incredible movement to actually capture Lookout Mountain. And Dave, could we get a few minutes on this? And it also has to do with the fact that the Trust is trying to preserve some land on Lookout Mountain, it is not a small tract as you're seeing here, Dave. Sure, uh, Lookout Mountain is uh, it's kind of an accidental battle. Um, Ulysses Grant didn't want to attack Lookout Mountain. George Thomas wanted to attack Lookout Mountain because Thomas was focused on restoring the railroad. But Grant, uh, looking at the Confederate dispositions, uh, leaned more towards an attack on the northern end of Missionary Ridge, uh, and he he figured that the Confederates were drawn out uh, over a long distance atop Lookout Mountain and across the Chattanooga Valley and then defending Missionary Ridge. So they're, they're trying to man a line of, of something like 12 to 15 miles. And if he takes Lookout Mountain, he drives Confederate troops back onto Missionary Ridge, he effectively uh, compresses the Confederate line. So Grant's leaning more towards uh, a quick a uh, more rapid reaction, an attack on the northern end of the ridge with his trusted uh, Army of the Tennessee under Sherman. Uh, and, and Sherman will begin that move uh, on November 24th. But uh, on the 23rd, just before all of these things were set to be put in motion, um, 
a pontoon bridge breaks on the Tennessee River. They've had heavy rains in October and the water levels are high. And so one of Sherman's divisions, Peter Osterhaus's uh, 15th Corps division is stranded on, uh, on that, that same side of the river across from Lookout Mountain with uh, Hooker uh, and, and Hooker who had had most of his troops stripped away from him for this grand movement that Grant contemplated. For instance, the 11th Corps was detached from him and, and moved up river. Uh, suddenly Hooker has three divisions and he sends a, a message to Grant uh, saying, look, I don't want to just sit around doing nothing. And, and he's been, Hooker's been pushing for this attack. He, he of course has his own motives for attacking. Um, he's got a reputation to redeem. And, uh, and also he sees the tactical opportunity that the mountain provides. You're right, you look at Lookout Mountain, you look up the Palisades at the top and you go, who's gonna climb up there? Uh, you, you know, you need, you need an Alpine Corps to take Lookout Mountain. But because of this opportunity and because Hooker has a plan to uh, suddenly Grant says, okay, you can attack, uh, make a demonstration. Uh, and if, if something better comes of it, that's fine. But, but it was never in Grant's plan to assault Lookout Mountain. But Hooker very capably, uh, uh, and November 24th helps him a lot here because it's a cloudy, cold, wet, rainy day, lots of fog. Uh, if you've ever been in Chattanooga in the fall, uh, uh, you know, the fog can hang in the valleys. You can be on top of Lookout Mountain and be surrounded by just the white fluffy sea. Uh, and that's exactly what that kind of day was. And so Hooker is going to move down Lookout Creek. He's going to move south of the mountain beyond the Confederate line. He's going to cross the, the, the creek, uh, which is a, a fairly substantial body of water. It's not easy to cross, but he finds a place to cross at a place called Lights Mill, uh, which is just south of that tract of land. Uh, and a as a matter of fact, at, at the Reflection Riding Center today, there's a little signboard uh, that claims to have the original uh, millstones of Lights Mill on the property. I have no idea if that's true. And I've asked Jim Ogden at the uh, Chickamauga National Military Park if that's true. And he's also said, I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, Lights Mill is important. He's going to cross the creek there. And then he's going to move up the mountain about two thirds of the way. And, and once you get to that upper third, that's when the famous uh, slab-sided sandstone palisades uh, 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 appear. And so you can't really climb all the way to the top except in a few select places. But the Confederates aren't, aren't just defending the top of the mountain. Also, they, they have to defend that lower two thirds, that plateau that, uh, around the Craven House at the point of the mountain. They, that's where their bulk of their defenses are going to be oriented. But they're expecting or prepared for a direct attack. And if you look at the map uh, that Chris is showing here, you see those blue flooded areas of Lookout Creek. Lookout uh, Creek is at flood stage. The Tennessee is at flood stage. So it's very, very difficult to get across the creek. So this makes Hooker's plan all the more remarkable. The troops are going to move up the side of the mountain. And then they're going to uh, basically uh, uh, face to their right or face to their left rather. And then they're gonna sweep the length of the mountain, the, the nose all the, all the way around the nose. You can see the arrows on the, uh, of the movement drawn on the map. And so when people stand at the foot of Lookout Mountain or if they're down in Wenatchee Valley or, or, or uh, at uh, where, where we like to take folks because it's a spectacular view, the Walmart parking lot there you look up at Lookout Mountain, they're not charging up towards the top of the mountain. They're charging around the mountain in, in sort of a, uh, a squeegee motion. And wow. they, uh, they'll work their way. They surprise the Confederates uh, and they outflank the defensive line. The guys at the top of the mountain are still too high and, and uh, are having trouble do, uh, delivering any sort of effective fire uh, on the Federals below them. Uh, it's really a remarkable tactical operation. It doesn't cost uh, a lot of casualties, um, approximately 800 Federals and, and roughly 1,000 Confederates, many, many ca uh, captured Confederates here. Uh, but it's, uh, 
it's the first real um, uh, success of the uh, of the the Battle of Chattanooga. It's a, a solid federal success. Uh, Hooker has done an excellent job of planning and coordination. He has three divisions from three different corps from literally three different armies. He has a division of the 12th Corps, a division of the 4th Corps, and a division of the 15th Corps. None of these people have worked together before. Uh, he really pulls off uh, a remarkable success. Uh, of course, after the war, Grant will, will kind of disparage the battle and refer to it as, as, uh, as pure poetry. Uh, but that's because... Um, uh, I think largely because Grant, it, it didn't really fit into Grant's overall plan. Uh, and to a certain extent, it had an effect that, that Grant was worried about. Those Confederates come back off the mountain overnight and they do reinforce the line on Missionary Ridge. But nevertheless, it's a dramatic victory. It's made all the more dr dramatic. It went on the morning of November 25th, uh, which is a completely different day weather-wise than November 24th. It, uh, it's clear and cold, the cold front has moved in and it's crystal clear. And um, the natural amphitheater that is Chattanooga, everybody can look and see the Union flag of the 8th Kentucky Infantry first to be hoisted there at the point, the prow of Lookout Mountain. That's, that's great, Dave. And I, I wanna see if Eric has anything to say before we do it. It's just while you were talking, it reminds me of something Chris and I often like to do. Yes, we do talk about the Western Theater and we sort of imagine the couriers coming in and delivering news to General Grant. And the first one shows up and says, look out, mountain is taken. And Grant says, way to go, Sherman. And then after <laughs> Thomas takes Missionary Ridge, General, uh, you know, uh, Missionary Ridge is ours. Way to go, Sherman. Sherman. <laughs> yes, Sherman, Sherman's uh, performance on November 24th, he crosses the river. Uh, uh, at dawn in an assault, amphibious, uh, you know, they use pontoon boats, uh, they, they uh, launch an amphibious assault, they cross the river, they establish a bridge, uh, and then the rest of November 24 uh, is, is lackluster. Sherman pushes forward very gradually, uh, thinks he gets to Missionary Ridge, but never gets on top, uh, and so his performance, as contrasted with, with Thomas and especially Hooker, his performance is going to be fairly disappointing through the entire uh, several days of the Ch uh, Chickama or Chattanooga campaign. Cool, Eric. Anything to add? Oh gosh, no. I I I, I feel like I feel like just a tourist right now because <laughs> for me, Chattanooga um, has always been a place that I've just enjoyed visiting. So to hear from an expert, I mean, I'm I'm probably enjoying this as much as anybody else watching. Cool. Well, we're going to move up to areas that you know a little bit more, but before we do, just note that at the end, I do hope that we have a couple of moments to talk about not only preservation, but our ability to visit um, the places that we're talking about here today, namely Chattanooga and Franklin. So um, as Chris shows a cool uh, shot of uh, Lookout Mountain rising above the city of Chattanooga, I do think you should go. Um, and then after the Battle of Chattanooga, of course, we talked about it already. There's that Atlanta campaign thing, and that will in itself result in John Bell Hood's movement that uh, Eric talked about through Alabama and into Tennessee. Um, uh, we, I don't want to get hung up on Spring Hill, but it's an important part of it. So Eric, why don't you get into it? What's going on at Spring Hill and then namely at Franklin and namely there sort of on the eastern side? Well, Hood's movement um, into Middle Tennessee had gone although he was delayed in North Alabama for several weeks, had, had gone really much according to plan. And Spring Hill, I think, is one of those moments that, that I don't think there's anything else quite like it during the, during the course of the war. Um, Hood knew that if he had any opportunity to take Nashville, which is a long shot, uh, regardless, he had to try and destroy uh, the enemy that was in his front. And that's uh, John Schofield, who's in command of uh, the 4th and the 23rd Corps, 27, 28,000 men plus cavalry. And so Hood launches a flanking maneuver, moves out from Columbia, leaves a third of his army there, takes two thirds of it with him on a wide flanking maneuver to the east. He is successful in gaining um, Schofield's rear, but through a series of episodes that I, I spent years when I worked on my first book, just trying to kind of unravel it because it was so cloaked in myth and legend. 
you know, really, I think Spring Hill comes down to a couple of things. On the Confederate side, it is overconfidence. It is miscalculation. It is human error. And they came so close, but two, three, four hundred yards was the, was the difference between their objective, which was to block the Columbia Turnpike and cut off Schofield's route of retreat northward. Um, and so their margin of error was, was just that, a, you know, a couple of football fields, really. And, um, but it's easy to forget what the U.S. Army did that night. And John Schofield, um, certainly that night probably is one that he and others never forgot because they took advantage of every mistake the Confederates committed and they took advantage of it. And that night, Schofield moved his army from Columbia through Spring Hill all the way to Franklin, which is, you know, depending on who started where, it's about 27 or 28 miles. So he, he moves the entire army that distance. He moves 800 supply wagons, thousands of animals on a night of new moon. So it's just completely dark. And it's just this incredible escape. And he gets to Franklin. He doesn't want to be in Franklin. He knows he's been doggone lucky just to, to escape Hood's clutches, not only at Spring Hill, but even from Columbia a few days earlier. So he, he just wants to get to Nashville. But he gets stuck in Franklin because the river is an obstacle. Um, bridges have got to be repaired. Because Schofield's got lots of, got a lot of troops, but he's also got lots of stuff. And um, so he's trapped. And so he um, and Jacob Cox, who really takes command of the, the main line of defense, they, they construct a, a, a temporary defensive position. Schofield's plan is to, is to you know, get out of Dodge. He doesn't, he's going to leave as soon as it's dark. You know, sunsets early you know, everywhere this time of year, but um, sets about 4.30. And so he's, he's going to eat back about 6 o'clock. And here comes Hood in the Army of Tennessee. And, um, you know, there's, there's just something about, I think, that day. It's the war is three and a half years old. Um, there, it's, it's pretty clear Lee's trapped in Virginia. Rumors have already started to spread that Sherman's cut loose of Atlanta. Um, the war has become a bitter, ugly contest, as much of 64 was, you know, from the Oberlin campaign through Atlanta. Um, you know, dare I say that the, the Emancipation Proclamation is, you know, 19, 20 months old. Lincoln's been reelected. This is now a war to save the Union and end slavery. And I think there's just a lot of surging emotion. And all the Confederate soldiers, they, they, they didn't make they didn't know exactly what had happened at Spring Hill, but they knew they knew what had happened, which was that the Yankees had gotten away. And and, you know, Nashville's just up the road. And I, I was struck years ago when I first found a, an account written by a Mississippi, and he's just one guy, but he said, it was better to be defeated in a blaze of glory than die a coward. And I think a lot of guys in the AOT that day knew that you know, this might be it. And Hood issued the orders for an attack. Hood gets there. He sees Schofield's planning to leave. I mean, Hood's, Hood knows what the game is. And I think there's a lot of similarities to July 3rd, 1863. Robert E. Lee didn't want to make that attack at Gettysburg, but he felt he had to. The difference at Franklin is it's 18 months later and the situation's even more desperate for the Confederacy. And those guys, um, you know, I was just looking at the map. I mean, some of those guys in Walthall's division have been up on, you know, they, they were there when Hooker's men pushed them off and now it's a year later and they still believe they could win. Otherwise, why keep fighting? They really did. They, they thought they thought they could still take Nashville. You, know, it, you never want to equip the military with football, but, you know, you're down by three touchdowns and there's seven minutes left. And you think, oh, we'll still win this. Get that touchdown and we'll get that onside kick. And human beings are just not wired to just quit. And boy, well, these guys in the AOT didn't have any quit. But, you know, neither did the guys in the fourth and the 23rd Corps who'd been all over the place. These two sides had fought each other. I mean, some of these guys had just fought one another at, at Kennesaw Mountain and Peachtree Creek just a few months earlier. And then at four o'clock it starts. And my God, what a what a spectacle. I mean, 20,000 Southern troops, six divisions, 18 brigades, 100 regiments, 60 degrees, and it's clear. 
and, and, and the weather was just, you know, it wasn't like there was ominous weather. It's just, the, it's the height of irony. It's a beautiful day in middle Tennessee. And it was just minutes before the bloodletting just began. And when it started, uh, it, it, when, when, when it began at Franklin, it was like the gods of war um, doubled down. And the pent up fury of a generation that found themselves caught up in this war just seems to get unleashed at Franklin. It, it, it's, it's, I think, a lot like Spotsylvania. It was just violence that nobody, nobody who was there could ever describe. And if you weren't there, you'd never understand. And, you know, there's initial success. We should never forget that John Bell Hood's desperate gamble in Tennessee, but at Franklin, almost worked. And the U.S. Army was punctured in the center. Um, it broke. There's a, there's a gap, you know, with all, with all due respect to the Confederates on that third day at Gettysburg, Pickett and Pettigrew and Trimble's guys, they, they were blistered and burned before they ever even got up to the works for the most part, not here. There are elements of two Confederate divisions that come blasting right through the center. They rip this huge hole. Schofield's army is busted in two and only through really three separate events, which is a, a valiant stand by some new troops, a counter assault by some veterans and, and other guys who were out on that advance line and the main line you know, they've gotten pushed back, kind of like, you know, if you dial that, if you dial the war back to April 6, 1862, not every, not every federal soldier who got pushed back that first day jumped in the Tennessee River and swam away. You know, a lot of those guys just wanted somebody to tell them to rally. That's what happened at Franklin. So you got the new guys, the veterans are counterattacking and the rallied veterans and everybody kind of just, you know, gritted their teeth and and the Confederates gave them everything they had, and it was a slugfest. And to, to me, I, I think you can see the echoes of Shiloh and Murfreesboro and Chattanooga and Chickamauga and all those battles of Atlanta. It's almost like it all gets balled up at Franklin. It's like the supernova goes off. And then it's dark, you know, and then by five o'clock, it's dark. The battle's reached its apex, but now you've got you know, the battle starts with 40,000 men, but let's say there's still 35,000 swinging. Think about that. There's 35,000 guys just beating the hell out of each other at close quarters for the next two or three hours. It's really telling. John Bell Hood, who'd been at Gettysburg, and Thomas Ruger is a federal division commander, been at Gettysburg. You know, these guys were everywhere. Uh, Antietam, Second Manassas. Both of them independently in separate accounts said the volume of fire at Franklin exceeded anything they'd ever heard. I mean, goodness. Because you didn't usually see 40,000 guys just wailing at each other continuously for, for hours. Um, it's a little like Antietam, except it's in the dark. And then, you know, eventually there just, there just wasn't, there wasn't enough energy to keep it going. The killing and the maiming and the wounding and could only go on so long. And then, and then it just sort of sputters out. You know, it, in, in three or three and a half hours, the main part of the battle is really over. And then it's about an hour, hour and a half. It just sort of spasms of fighting. It, even to me, and I'm, and I'm here every day, it's hard to imagine how 10,000 casualties can unfold in basically three or three and a half hours. I mean, it is just, it, it's staggering. And I think that's why the veterans struggled with it. And actually, you know, not, not to jump into, into reclamation, I think that's why so many guys on both sides wanted posterity. They wanted us to see it because they wanted, you know, obviously everyone wanted to be able to say, hey, here's where I was and here's where I fought. But I know a lot of these guys wanted people to see Franklin because they understood that we probably should never do this again. <laughs> We should probably never get to a point where we can do this to one another. You know, then it's over. U.S. Army pulled out. They leave their dead, most of the wounded. And the Confederates are left to deal with the wreckage the next day. Boy, there are, I was much younger. Look at, look that. at that guy. Look at that. Look at that young guy. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, the Confederates the next day had to bury the dead, which is god-awful. 
process. And then you know, they go to Nashville and then the war is over in a few months. I think you got to come through Franklin, not only to see where the Western theater starts to fade, but, but where the war starts to fade away. And then, and then look, there's Carnton, you know, there are the dead that are dead, gathered up, laid to rest. You know, the Confederate dead are here, the U.S. dead go to Murfreesboro. Quite a place. Let's, uh, thank you. Thanks, Eric. That's great. So before we talk a little bit more about preservation, um, you know, how does somebody go see Franklin? Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people know about the Carter House. I think a real lot of people, even people watching here, probably never gone to Franklin. So how much time does someone need? And, and what do they do when they go there in a nutshell? You know, that answer is different now than it was 15 years ago, because you guys at the Trust and what we've done, you know, with Franklin's Charge and just the Battle of Franklin Trust and, you know, us kind of putting our efforts together, you can now spend all day, just like you can at a normal Civil War site. You know, you can really take the day and you visit Carter House in Carton and we'll, you know, you can get um, tours that'll tell you about the family and the battle and the aftermath, but we now offer battlefield tours and extended tours and I think we have something really special. You know, there's a pre-war story here and a post-war story, but it all it all pivots on that one day. But at a minimum, you could spend an hour and a half. If you want to visit both, it's three or four hours. But literally, we, as you know, Gary, we've now saved 150 acres in Franklin, both at Eastern Flank and Carter Hill Park. So you can make a day of it. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago, you used to have to tiptoe around pizza places and strip malls and golf courses. And now it's just... No, it's just, it's just a park. God, I just thought about something Ed Barr said, you know, and, and since he just passed away, I, Barr's, this had to be 15 years ago. We were doing one of those first tours ever on the Eastern flank and Barr's, you know, you, you can't imitate him. You can only try, but he, he told everybody, he said, stop, listen. And then everybody does. And, you know, all you could hear were like the birds chirping. And he said, that's what a battlefield is supposed to sound like. And it was so cool. And, and now, you know, people, I think they can get some sense of that serenity that you experience on a battlefield and then think about it was nothing but serene on the day of. Thanks, Eric. And Chris has uh, the map up that we've been showing here and you can see the sort of brown and blue uh, splotches on the map where uh, both trusts, Battle of Franklin Trust and uh, American Battlefield Trust, uh, always in partnership, has been able to preserve some of this. And on the sort of mid upper right, uh, you can see uh, the track that you're going to hear about uh, in the mail or via your email if you haven't already. Uh, this was a great example of how we come together on this stuff. I mean, we, the, the American Battlefield Trust can't do anything without our local partners, in this case, the, case, the Battle of Franklin Trust. But um, look at the Friends of Perryville or the Georgia Battlefield Association, um, the park partners at Chattanooga. Uh, look at the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust. We can't do any of our work without these great local groups on the ground. And, and it's really been um, excellent. So we hope you support that effort. And we hope you visit, of course, um, Carter House Carnton and the park there to see some of what you um, our members and supporters have been able to do um, in partnership. Um, so let's let's finalize things, you know, with moving on to Dave, you know, the uh, the trust and its partners, to my knowledge, have saved about 53,000 acres um, overall. 3,600 of these are in Tennessee. Uh, the biggest chunks are at Shiloh and Davis Bridge, um, pretty much equal in people's must visit sites. We've got to see Shiloh. We've got to see Davis Bridge. Wait, I'm joking about one of those. Um, <laughs> But, um, but as Eric mentioned, you know, between one and 200 at, uh, at Franklin, uh, closer to 200 at Spring Hill. And at Chattanooga, there's a little bit more of a challenge, not so much Chickamauga, where you have this huge, continuous, um, contiguous park. Um, Chattanooga is set up a little bit differently. So what's the preservation like there? And how does somebody see Chattanooga, Dave? Um, well, first you go to Chickamauga and you spend you know, a couple of days on the 5,000 contiguous acres of Chickamauga. Uh, and then you realize when you look at those maps that, that there's much more preserved land. It's harder to get to. I actually think Franklin is a bit of an inspiration because uh, 
once upon a time, you'd go to Franklin and go, well, it's a pity this town has grown up and we're not going to have a battlefield here. Well, that's not true anymore. Um, and that's, uh, there's certainly possibilities. Um, it's harder uh, in some, uh, some areas. Uh, Missionary Ridge is very difficult, very pricey land, very uh, prestige housing for a lot of it. Not all of it. There's, there's some buying opportunities, shall we say. Uh, uh, specifically on Lookout Mountain, there is, uh, there's still a lot of open land. Uh, there's, there's still a lot of heavily wooded land. Uh, the slopes of the mountain uh, are, are, are still largely preserved. Um, the, the park now, Chickamauga Park now is some, is in excess of, I think, 10 or 11,000 acres. Uh, and, and only 5,000 of that is the, uh, the core Chickamauga battlefield. So there's a, another huge swath of land that's been preserved all around the town. And fortunately, Ch Chickamauga or, or the city of Chattanooga has uh, some pretty strong green space advocacy groups working hard. Uh, the Trust for Public Lands, uh, the city is trying to create its own greenways. And so you can do a good deal of walking uh, around those sites too. You can walk across Moccasin Bend now. You can uh, 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 you can see uh, uh, a lot more of, of the Chattanooga Lookout Mountain Battlefield. Uh, it's uh, if you uh, if we end up acquiring the Reflection Writing Center, that would be a tremendous boon because it's right in the middle of the Union Advance. And it's also already got a network of trails. It's not built up area. It is green space. Um, even has a couple of battlefield markers, uh, private uh, markers for the for the um, facility that they've put up. Uh, and uh, and and it would give us an opportunity to bring larger groups in. There's a lot of a lot of places at uh, at Chattanooga, for instance, where we can't take a bus. So it's very difficult to do battlefield tours. Uh, you can't take a bus down Missionary Ridge. You have to take small groups of people uh, on and walk, park and walk, that sort of thing. If we could put a bus somewhere in the Chattanooga uh, Lookout Mountain area there, say uh, with Reflection Writings parking lot and, and, and take a group just a, a few hundred yards onto the battlefield, it would be a tremendous advantage. So there are, there, there's far more than you can see in a single day, uh, but um, this will, uh, the more land that we acquire, the more opportunities that are out there, the easier it will be to get to these places and view these places. Great, thanks Dave. And I, I for one, you know, make sure when you go there, don't skip uh, the National Cemetery in Chattanooga where you can really lay out uh, all of the pros and cons of occupying Chattanooga or the outlying positions um, in, in one glimpse. And it's one of the grand panoramas of the Civil War, even if you're not on top of uh, uh, Lookout Mountain. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for uh, running the show this whole time. Uh, Eric and Dave, it's such a pleasure to listen to you both. Like Eric said, I've just been kind of a tourist here listening to you guys rock on this stuff. Uh, uh, on a separate note, this Midwest boy who has lost most of his Chicago accent uh, is happy to hear Dave uh, all the time. It reminds me of home, man. And I don't know how <laughs> much you think you sound Chicago, but you do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think I've gotten even a little bit more Chicago Chicago since I've been with you on this call. So um, guys, thanks so much for joining us. For all of y'all uh, and you watching, whichever one you prefer, uh, we hope we've answered some of your questions. Um, we hope we've engaged you with something you might not be used to. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you uh, to our guests and to Chris White for uh, doing the yeoman's work behind the scenes. And thank you all for supporting battlefield preservation. Thanks, guys. Thank you.